What is liberalism? What does it have to do with the problems we see all around us? And what does that mean for the future of the American Republic? Join us today as we discuss these questions and more with Dr. Patrick Deneen, author of Why Liberalism Failed. I'm Dr. Bob Rice, professor of catechetics at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Rice, a professor of catechetics here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we're talking about why liberalism failed. I'm joined by our guest panelist, Dr. William Newton, a theology professor here at Franciscan University who will be filling in for Dr. Regis Martin while he teaches in the university's semester abroad program in Austria, and regular panelist, Dr. Scott Hahn the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, Dr. Patrick Deneen. Patrick Deneen holds a BA in English Literature and a PhD in Political Science from Rutgers University. From 1995 to 1997, he was a speechwriter and special advisor to the director of the United States Information Agency. He taught at Princeton University and Georgetown University before joining the political science faculty of the University of Notre Dame, where he has taught for almost seven years now. He is the author and editor of numerous books and articles, including Conserving America, Thoughts on Present Discontents, Democratic Faith, and the subject of today's show, Why Liberalism Failed. Dr. Deneen, it's great to have you on the show. We're very grateful for your presence here. Thank you so much. Why don't we just start with, uh, you know, the book is called Why Liberalism Failed. How are we defining liberalism? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, it's uh, obviously not uh, what we typically think as mm -hmm. a kind of left uh, progressivism. I'm really here speaking of the broad philosophy and uh, political organization of liberalism as we think of it uh, as it's developed over the last 500 years or so. So it's not necessarily a conservative versus a liberal thing. You were really talking about the bigger picture of, of right. the system. Right. Uh, and in fact, uh, a part of the argument of the book is that what we think about typically as liberal and conservative in the American context are actually two different flavors of liberalism mm. so that we tend to be arguing within the frame of liberalism rather than across its deepest assumptions. And so really to call out why in some ways our political system is failing, not um, because one side is winning and another side is losing, but in some, some sense it's because both sides are winning, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah, in order to understand what you're doing, I think you take the reader back 500 years you know, to the foment, but then you also point out that the founding of America 250 years ago is sort of like an opportunity where you have liberalism full flowering. But the language of liberalism, I remember as an undergraduate, was sort of startling to discover back in the 19th century, you know, with John Stuart Mill. And the idea that, you know, utilitarian individualism, that was liberalism in the 19th century. Okay, so if that's liberalism, why has it been hijacked? Well, what you're pointing out, at least what you're showing me and others, uh, is that individualism, on the one hand, and collectivism or statism are really like interrelated, inseparably connected, and they're rooted in that same kind of worldview that began to emerge nearly 500 years ago. And so it calls for a sort of patient intellectual archaeology that doesn't require a PhD, though. I mean, what you're showing us is that the things that we assume are contradictory are more like brothers who are fraternal rivals. And I think that's really eye-opening. I'm grateful. I saw that. At that point, Kane Smith, yesterday, I was, I was in the car riding into campus, and the radio was on. And it, I think it was a Christian radio station, might not even Catholic radio station, but there was somebody giving their opinion, and he was saying, Look, look at the inner cities, look at the mess we've got, you know, fatherlessness, you know, and drugs. And, and he was saying, you know, a lot of this is to do with sort of left agenda. It's kind of moral liberalism that's le led to it, statism, which is sort of, t you know, makes fathers useless. And you, you could kind of agree with all that. Say, yeah, 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 yeah. But what was seen to be missing was that there's also the sort of ruthless economic liberalism, which right. makes people you know, financially insecure, means fathers don't have jobs. 
And that is also playing into the problems we've got. And that seemed to be something that struck me in your book. You really, you really are trying to sort of maybe for us, for us Catholics, I mean, we, and conservative maybe Catholics, you know, we, we can feel good about what that guy on the radio was saying. Mm. We don't really want to hear so much the other, the other part of the story. And, and you, you've got a nice balance, both parts of the story are in there, it seemed to me at least. So one thing maybe to just start with sort of definitions, one thing maybe we should clarify is um, what I mean by liberalism and going back 500 years or 200 years or 100 years or today is if we ask many of our students, maybe less so at Franciscan, but certainly at Notre Dame, what is freedom? What is liberty? They would tell me something along the lines of being able to do what I want to do. And we have to realize that that definition of liberty is a fairly new phenomenon in the history of the world. The, the language of liberty, indeed the word liberty or libertas in the Latin is very old, very ancient. And what it meant was the capacity to develop the disciplines or virtues of being a self-governing human being or a self-governing society. And so you have, for example, in books like Plato's Republic, an argument that simply doing what you want to do is a condition of slavery. slavery right. And you have, of course, St. Paul arguing that we can be slaves to sin. Uh, we might think we're free, but in fact we're in a kind of bondage. The revolution that takes place is a kind of philosophical revolution. It's certainly a theological revolution. It's a revolution in politics and economics, which replaces that older definition and, in fact, calls that now a form of bondage or limitation on self and instead calls liberty that condition of being free to do what we want to do. And we're living with the fruits of that, and it's in our economics, it's in our social lives, it's in our family lives or lack of family lives. And I would say that what we're seeing is a kind of collapse of the Western political tradition as a whole is in many ways the fruits of the first redefinition and now the instantiation of that viewpoint in our politics and across um, you know, human life today. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated what, what helped me get the concept, and maybe you can talk a little bit about it, was communism, fascism, liberalism. You know, these three very different ideologies. Uh, liberalism has survived in a very insidious way, but uh, maybe just for the listener who's still trying to get their head around this, how might what liberalism is doing compare to those other, those other ideologies? So one of the ways of thinking about the, the terrible 20th century in many ways was it was, for the, you know, really for the first time in human history, a contestation of ideologies, the, the three ideologies being liberalism, communism, and fascism. And by ideology, I mean not just a belief system, but a belief system based upon a theory of human nature that can't allow anything other than that theory of human nature, and which I think by a certain understanding would be considered to be a false understanding of human nature. And we can certainly see that, that lie under the certainly the, the lack of success of communism, mm -hmm. the idea that somehow people could be brought to a condition in which they wouldn't care about their own property or their own families or their own communities, that they would cease to have a sense of self or I. Um, but I think by that same estimation, liberalism is also a kind of ideology based on a theory of human beings in which we are radically uh, autonomous individual selves that in our natural condition, think here of someone like John Locke, in our natural condition, the way we should understand ourselves is as free, uh, autonomous human beings who are not fundamentally connected to other human beings, who are not defined through and, and by our relationships and our relationality. And that definition is also in some ways at the root of our ideology. Mm. And while those other two ideologies, communism and fascism, fell in the early part of the 20th century, I think liberalism as a different ideology is seeing its own limits and indeed the falseness of its understanding of human nature now coming to the fore. Mm. No, I, I appreciate this discussion, how it traces things back, you know, because Plato, but especially St. Paul, you know, in Galatians, he speaks of freedom, but this notion that he brings up, eleutheria, in the Greek has to do with the freedom of the children of God. And you think, well, children aren't free. There is really the definition of being unfree, uh, especially for us. Whereas the fatherhood of God, sharing the sonship of Christ, bringing people out of the sort of individual self bondage into the bonds of love. This is what for Paul really is the source of freedom. So truth and freedom, the truth and the reality of who we are, made in the image and likeness of God, redeemed by Christ, called into solidarity with all of the members of the mystical body, therein lies freedom, whereas that is such an alien conception of freedom from everything that we have, at least in the public discourse. 
But I also think that, you know, going back I, I don't want to just do archaeology here, but when you look at the French Revolution, you see the first full flowering of the violence against the Catholic worldview. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for centuries it had been a gradual, respectful rejection of the Catholic faith. Going back, you know, I don't want to go back too far, but you know, the notion of freedom from power, law, authority, that's already in the 1300s. Luther takes that and runs with it in a way that is you could say violent, but it's still a respectable debate at that point. But with the French Revolution kind of declaring all-out war on the Catholic Church, and their battle cry is liberty, fraternity, and equality. And my own understanding of liberalism, of fascism, and of communism, these are really the flowering of liberty, fraternity, and equality. Communism takes the egalitarian ideal and absolutizes that. Fascism takes the fraternal idea and absolutizes that. So when communism goes away in 89 with the fall of the Iron Curtain and Fukuyama celebrates the end of history because fascists are gone, communists are gone, and now liberalism alone is left, you point out that why liberalism failed is precisely because it succeeded. It unmasked itself and it showed how it was just as false as Nazism or communism. And I mean, this is setting an agenda for a, an understanding of history, of human nature, of political philosophy, of psychology. I mean, I think the table is set for a banquet for the next 10 years to really study this stuff and figure out, okay, we've got to find a way forward, but we're not going to know if it's forward or not until we re realize where we've come from and why we've made so many wrong turns. Yeah, I think I'm particularly taken by the, the anthropological roots that you kind of show to, to liberalism there. And it seems that that again, again, is just this, such an important starting place. I'm thinking of, for example, the theology of the body. John Paul II wants to make some comment on the, the, the sexual, social, uh, modern context. And he does that by going back to an anthropology and saying, and if you have this anthropology, you lead to this kind of society and moral understanding. And if you have this anthropology, you go somewhere else. And it seems that there's various elements which are, which are just not true about liberalism's anthropology. One is that you know, we are dependent rational animals. We're not just rational animals. And we're dependent rational animals who have a transcendent goal. And the dependence and the transcendence seem to be wiped away. And you're left with a very sort of thin man, thin anthropology. And so you get a kind of thin political theory. Does that, does that seem true? Yeah, no, and I'm actually struck by something that, that Scott just said, which is um, to redefine in some ways thinking of ourselves in terms of our relationality. And so what is, it, what is it a philosophy that begins by saying you're not a child and that you are in some senses only accidentally or only by a kind of uh, a form of radical individual choice? Do you become a parent or do you become married? In other words, that we're understood in our fundamental natural aspect as separate human beings, as independent human beings. And think about what that means then, no longer to think of myself as a child, as a, as a, uh, a sibling, as a parent, um, as, as, as participating in a web of relationships. And, and the kind of consequences we would expect to see of that, some of the consequences I think we would expect to see is people who increasingly are incapable of expressing forms of gratitude. Mm. Right? Gratitude for what is given, gratitude for what they've been given. And correspondingly, the inability to sort of take on a sense of obligation for the future, for future generations. And I think this basic anthropological assumption manifests itself in things we might not think about as, as uh, for example, what kind of civilization gives its children debt uh, as, in some senses, their inheritance, right? What is the sign and, and mark of that kind of a civilization. It's the opposite of what a responsible civilization should do for its young people. And we could just begin to talk about all the various pathologies in our politics, our society, our economics, our family lives, and really track them back to these basic, really radical anthropological assumptions that I think lie at the heart of the liberal tradition. That notion of leaving debt as an inheritance landed on the back of my retina like a laser beam. I mean, that is piercing. Yeah. penetrating to the heart of it. I mean, to see that as a viable economic policy just sort of like explodes as, you know, absurdity. You know, but the thinness of our anthropology, that we have real no depend, we, we want to deny dependence, we want to deny transcendence and just be these autonomous selves. You know, 
it, it's so counterfactual. It's so unnatural. You know, nobody is born into this world as an individual. There's a relational ontology, a kind of family matrix that we just want to repress. You are born a son or a daughter. You know, might not have a happy marriage that you're coming from, but the fact is you're coming from a physical act of interpersonal love, whether it was true or falsified. You know, and just to state that in some ways is to state the obvious, but it's also to kind of state what most people would say is either absurd or irrelevant, because that's exactly what we need to be liberated from. And so liberalism is sort of like this notion of liberty or liberation. We are liberated from transcendence. We are also liberated from dependence and then we're left alone. Why does it fail? Because it succeeded, you know? That's like, oh, so provocative. And yet, it's also somewhat commonsensical now. Once it's set, you know, it, there's a series of laser beams here, you know? And that's one of the things I loved about your book. I mean, I, I had a number of moments of, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is so obvious, but it's something I hadn't seen before. Yeah. And I know as the show goes on, uh, we're gonna continue to talk about many of those insights in the book. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so please stay with us as Franciscan University Presents continues. Advanced Western liberalism seems to have reached a dead end. Having promised liberation from any constraint that is not chosen by the consent of the individual, we have created nations of individualists who are now responsible to no one in particular, but simultaneously subjects of an all-encompassing state and international order. At the moment that liberalism has succeeded, it has also visibly failed. Dr. Patrick Deneen. When God created you, He made you like no other person. You are unique, singular, and unrepeatable. So shouldn't your college experience be the same? At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith and reason, wisdom and grace, mercy and truth. You'll study under world-class scholars and seasoned practitioners who are committed to Christ and His Church. With over 40 majors and pre-professional programs, you'll find the formation you need to succeed. You'll discover lifelong friends and mentors who will welcome you, challenge you, and encourage you. Because we believe as Catholics, we are not called to hide from culture, but transform it. At Franciscan University, you'll find more than just a college. You'll find yourself and an educational experience as singular as you are. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking about why liberalism failed with our guest, Dr. Patrick Deneen. Um, at the end of the last segment, you know, you made a very startling comment of what kind of society is it that would leave debt to the next generation as opposed to a gift. And uh, when I read your book, you had a, a very startling quote from a student, you know, that you, you teach. And I, you know, we all have the opportunity to teach students. It really spoke to my heart. Um, the, the anxiety of the student, I mean, maybe you could, you could share a little bit more about that conversation of either you're at the very top or you're at the very bottom and there is no middle ground in terms of the way that they're, they're approaching life. Well, in many ways, we live in the world that was constructed by, in harsher terms, by someone like Thomas Hobbes and in seemingly less harsh terms by someone like John Locke, mm. in which you're basically either kind of winning or losing. We th that we think in many ways about the, the organization of our society as you're either rising or falling. Mm. And maybe this generation, uh, more than any other generation, has completely imbibed uh, and uh, taken that basic philosophy into their hearts. It defines how they understand themselves in relationship to others. Uh, it's very difficult for them for this reason to form friendships and deep relationships. I think this helps to explain, among other things, why love is so difficult hmm. uh, for so many young people today. The idea of committing to someone in that kind of self-emptying way becomes very difficult when the world is really one of fundamental, rapacious competitiveness. And so uh, I actually assigned a two-page essay to my students, which I asked them to think about what they're doing in university. And this one quote came from one of those little essays in which this person said, what I would really like to do 
in my heart is to spend time with my fellow students exploring ideas, discussing the great books. But I know if I do that, I'm falling behind competitively um, yeah. my, my, my fellow students. And if not here, then at other universities as well. So again, this, this becomes internalized uh, by students. And you, you know, what you could say then as a consequence of this is that anything that binds us in a deep way into the lives of others become, hampers our ability or the ability especially of this generation to understand themselves as getting ahead. So liberalism kills liberal education. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, that's kind of that's paradoxical. Yeah, that's actually a chapter of my book. And ironically enough, uh, uh, and you think of the words liberal here, mm -hmm. uh, liberal education and liberalism, you would think the two would flourish together. But in fact, think about the differences of the definition of liberty that we talked about in the last segment. Mm -hmm. If liberty is a kind of learned capacity through discipline and virtue to govern yourself, then a liberal education is central. It's essential to that kind of cultivation. But if liberty is the ability to do whatever it is I want to do without limit or obstacle, then an education increasingly is going to become focused on what are the skills and practices I need to roll back any limitations. So science, technology, mm -hmm. um, these kinds of disciplines, but also in the humanities, a, re, a kind of redefinition of the humanities as fundamentally liberative. And think of the kind of the philosophies in the humanities today, postmodernism, poststructuralism, radical forms of uh, liberationist philosophy today. Mm -hmm. You know, I keep coming back to this sense that I don't think that word means what you think it means, you know, <laughs> from Princess Bride, because liberal, liberal education, liberalism, liberal arts, I mean, it's a concatenity, it, it, it's, it's cacophony, it's, it's total confusion. I, I just think that uh, the liberal arts are antithetical to liberalism. And you spell out how liberalism marks the death of that sort of thing. And so people walk away saying, well, then I don't know what words mean. But in fact, liberal arts were meant to liberate. You know, so with grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So you know how to speak meaningfully, you can persuade people, you can prove things, you can persuade people, and then the quadrivium takes you into reality to understand truth in order to really be free and to live the truth. I mean, this is classical pre-Christian understanding of what it means to be truly free. And what Christianity does with this, it just takes it to an entirely new level, and yet all of this is wiped away. You know, in, in, a, in a series of, I don't know if you want to call them, you know, philosophical tsunamis or whatever, but we don't even know where to look for these kinds of things. You know, and so on a TV show, EWTN, you know, where we want to kind of hold fast to our political stand, you know, where we're Americanist or individualist, you know, or free market, to call any of that into question, you know, is to be not only unnecessarily provocative, but to sort of be a subversive. And yet the only path to the future long term is to recognize some of the problematic features of the things that we would embrace because we're not Democrats, we're not liberals. And it's like, time out, you know, we gotta go back and relearn these terms and make all kinds of distinctions that have been lost. Of course, one question just about uh, something else in the book that struck me was this idea that liberalism has failed almost on its own terms, because in a way, we can criticize it as failing, failing from our point of view and from our understanding of what liberty is. It's not really liberty. But I got a sense that in your book, there's also a sense that it failed on its own terms. So it's meant to bring about uh, equality, but we have a kind of arist new aristocracy of the rich. It's, it's meant to bring about freedom, but everybody is just a consumer, so they're no longer free. And I was struck um, some years ago hearing that um, a high court judge, a Supreme Court judge in, in, actually in the UK, he was saying, it's, actually, it's very, very difficult, my job now, because so many new laws come up. And he said during the premiership of Tony Blair, 10-year premiership, he said there were 26,000 new regulations came on the book. <laughs> and I checked this in the States, and on the Federal Register, there's, on average, 2,500 new regulations every year in the States. So it's, it's in the same league. Right. And it made me think, look, contentless freedom actually kills freedom because there's no, the, the high court judge point was, uh, there's no more virtue or Christian ethic inside people, so we have to regulate their activity because it's not coming from within. And that seemed to be maybe a point in your book that even on its own terms, it's kind of turned on itself. Is that? Yeah, so fair? one of the, yeah, I think that's, that's right. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about liberalism and its self-conception is that um, we especially want to develop the tools that will allow for this liberation. So transforming education is one of the ways in which we do this. 
um, and the sense of entrapment that my student expresses, one of the ironies, well, how can this liberative exercise make my students feel like they have no choice about what it is they're going to do with their lives? Or think about the ways in which we speak, for example, about um, globalization or automation today, uh, certain kind of technological developments. And if you listen to people closely, they speak about these in terms of inevitability, uh, a condition in which we have no choice that we're going to have driverless cars, there's no choice in the matter, we're going to have um, robots that will replace most of the workforce, we, ha we have no choice in that matter. And uh, the irony of a political and economic and social order that's premised on the idea of making us free and yet in which we conclude we have no power over the tools that we require for our, our liberation. Right. Economic again, think, determinism it, will liberate us right, and enslave. Right, yeah. right, and so the kind of paradox I think mm -hmm. we see with the just very easy use of that language of inevitability suggests something deeply and almost paradoxically yet revealingly contradictory about liberalism. Mm -hmm. And so as Catholics, you know, having the, the broad sense of history, um, what, is, what is the Catholic counter to liberalism? Sure, well, I, I guess the first thing I would say was the purpose of the book, and I didn't specifically write it for Catholics, but I hope that Catholics read it. And in particular, read it in the light of our understanding, one I think that's been expressed uh, throughout the history of Catholicism, uh, but certainly I think most powerfully by Augustine, which is to always understand that we are pilgrims in this world, and that of course we live in particular places and times and under particular regimes, but our loyalty extends to something beyond any particular regime. And if that regime is not in conformity with our deepest loyalties, then we have to be able to, in some ways to be capable of psychically separating ourselves from the corruptions of that regime. So I think Catholics have wanted to be very good Americans, and in this sense also to be, to the extent possible, very good liberals. But where that is beginning to contradict what it is our faith demands of us, we need to have the ability to sort of psychically separate ourselves from some of those commitments. But further and more challenging today, it seems to me, is to infuse the world to the extent that we can with a very different understanding, a very different anthropology of the human person, right? Something that draws from the idea of the Trinity, that we are fundamentally relational because God is relational. God is relational with God, and God is relational with us. Uh, to think of ourselves as children, to think of ourselves as part of a created order that we don't control and that our technology does not control and ought not to control. So I think Catholics have something very distinctive to bring to America and to the world today. Uh, but the challenge is for us first to understand our own condition uh, and to realize in some ways that we, that the condition that in some ways we take for granted is itself in many ways corrupting. You know, at one level, when you say the Trinity, you know, what difference does that make? Well, we all believe it, but we don't really contemplate what difference it makes. Because at one level, it just seems like, well, that is so elusive, so lofty, so impractical and inapplicable to our, and yet, what is the Trinity? It's fatherhood, it's sonship, you know, and the Holy Spirit who overshadows the Blessed Virgin creates a kind of divine maternity as well. Well, suddenly, what seems so lofty just becomes embodied in a way. And I think we, we as Catholics, as, a, as we broaden our view of history, we recognize, I've already mentioned this, so I'll bring it up again, liberty, fraternity, and equality. I mean, who can deny those things? Well, what we don't recognize is that at the time of the French Revolution, they were weaponizing those terms. Mm -hmm. Liberty as opposed to authority. Fraternity as opposed to paternity or maternity. And equality as opposed to hierarchy. Suddenly, the tradition has been jettisoned with a rhetorical sleight of hand that is substantive, I mean massive, and yet subtle enough to take centuries to unfold. And so as we broaden this view of history and we recover liberal arts and as we also kind of deepen the insight into what difference does it make that God became man as the Son of God becoming the Son of Man to impart this sonship, to create a sense of family solidarity that so often in Africa is celebrated joyously in a way that we're even afraid to talk about. And I, I, don't, I don't think that our, our recovery is going to be the result of the academy thinking these things through and coming up with this theoretical construct that why this is better than liberalism. You know, it's going to come from the Eucharist. It's going to come from, you know, devotion to the motherhood of, the, of, of Mary and that sort of thing that will obviously seem silly to a lot of our colleagues in the academy. So Patrick, you, you spoke about sort of psychological separation. Uh, do you, is that as far as we should go? Do you, do, do you have any thoughts on sort of, you know, more physical separation? Well, um, 
In some senses, yes, uh, uh, that uh, it may require thinking, living in a way that's in some ways distinct from the world around us, may require, among other things, making sure that we're living in communities that are supportive of the kind of families, the kind of beliefs that we hope to instill and impart in the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, here I'll give at least a, a shout out to Hillary Clinton, which is it does take a village to raise a child. Now, I don't think she meant village. I think she meant the federal government. I actually think, <laughs> it, I think it takes a village. I mean, right. I think, in other words, it takes um, not just polis. a family, but it takes a polis. It takes a collection of families and a community and a church to raise a family. Uh, and we live in such a world where all of our lives are kind of chopped up. We, are, we live lives of disintegration. I think, I think you know, the Catholic ideal in every sense is integration. Mm -hmm. uh, integration of, of faith and reason, integration of the liberal arts and the servile arts, integration of, um, of church and home and community. I mean, all the levels that we, th that we think of and speak of integration. So the extent to which we can create more integrated lives would mean that we may have to think much harder about the kind of places in which we're going to settle and raise children and the, and the kind of communities we're going to join in that sense. So I don't think of it as physical separation, like go out to a hut uh, so that you're not tainted anymore, but rather thinking about what do I need to do in the way in which I live my life that will help to foster the kind of community that can not only help me to raise my family, raise my children, but now increasingly to be a kind of witness, an alternative way of life in an increasingly corrupt world. It's just the way that the early church gave an example of how you could live your life to a pagan world that was shocked and then amazed and then fundamentally transformed by that, by that witness. I still think something could be said for separation, though, because, you know, come out of her, my people. We, you don't want to do that before it's necessary. But at some point, when traditional morality becomes hate speech, to impart it to your kids is an injustice. I think at that point, we have to at least leave the back door unlocked. Yeah, well, and we will continue with this wonderful conversation with Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. At the root of liberal philosophy, family life is displaced by calls to individual authenticity, backstopped by a welfare state that will take care of you cradle to grave. Schooling that reinforces the formation of character is replaced with an education in non-judgmentalism. Cultures must be liquefied, most often in the name of multiculturalism and diversity. Religious belief is weakened by appeals to individual conscience and toleration. With ancient calls to self-discipline and self-limitation, redescribed as hatred and bigotry. Dr. Patrick Deneen. You don't have to trade top flight academic programs for a passionately Catholic identity. You can have both. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll not only deepen your faith, you'll be prepared for real world success by dedicated professors for whom excellence isn't just a goal, but the standard. Ready to get started? Check out franciscan.edu. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents and we're coming to you from the Communication Arts Studio here on the campus of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and equipment and my colleagues in the theology department, Dr. William Newton and Dr. Scott Hahn, are guiding our discussion with our special guest, Dr. Patrick Deneen. As we were uh, discussing it, and you mentioned Augustine earlier in the show, I couldn't help but think of City of God you know, that beautiful um, political catechesis of a sort that talked about how we live in different cities and yet we're in the same place. And so we're citizens of a higher kingdom. And that means we have to figure out a way to get along. You know, there, there can be common goods. There can be, you know, even if our ultimate end is different, our immediate needs, the immediate idea of good is something that we can work together with. So in light of that, and particularly the way you work with students at Notre Dame, is there a way to, is there a way to baptize uh, liberalism? Is it uh, just dead and gone? How might we, coming from a Catholic perspective, uh, engage the culture and, in, and engage the world, uh, and particularly in our Western culture that's so steeped in this mindset? Well, I, I often think about the ways that um, the language that we use in our debates hasn't changed. So thinking of the language of liberty, everyone's for liberty. 
It just turns out how we understand that word can be very, really quite different. Uh, and in many ways, you could say the great success of liberalism was, was colonizing old words and uh, old concepts with a very new definition. And it seems to me that there's a kind of task, if there's a task for us, I don't see it as fomenting a political revolution. I think political revolutions can be very dangerous and uh, I don't, uh, I, you know, once you unleash that genie, uh, uh, unpredictable things can happen. But the process of a kind of colonization or, or de and recolonization seems to me something that we could really take on. And this is where being an educator is so vitally important where we can begin to populate the moral imagination of our students with a very different conception of what matters, what they should be committed to. Right? Augustine says, right, you will know a city, in some ways you can judge a city based upon what it and its citizens love. Mm. And what is it we love? And what is it we want to encourage our students and our children to love? And I would say right now our loves are disordered, deeply disordered, uh, in, in part because in some ways we're not capable of loving and the things that we love are things like wealth, uh, prosperity, power, uh, the ability to manip manipulate nature. And if we can populate the imagination uh, and the deepest commitments of our students with a, with a different, and I think a truer understanding of what is that which should be loved, especially at Catholic institutions like the ones that we teach at, and then send forth our students and our children into the world, not simply to separate, but to evangelize. Uh, we might hope for uh, something really, uh, we'll never have a paradise on earth, but a better place and a place that more accords, I think, uh, with the hopes and aspirations of our, of our Christian faith. Mm -hmm. You know, when you speak of the uh, colonization of a, of a previous way of thinking, I think there's a certain degree of beautiful irony there because we are now decolonizing in a certain sense. Or, you know, when you say city of God, I think we assume we know what that means because an urban metropolis is a city. But when you go back and look at De Civitate Dei, you know, the, the connection between the city that Augustine envisions and the cities that we grew up in are stark. They're very, very different. You know, I remember reading Fustel de Coulange, the ancient city. It was life changing to go back and look at what Greeks meant by polis. The city state was not an urban metropolis, much less an urban sprawl. It was an extended family that was primarily religious with the altar at the center, you know. And you go back and you realize that even Aristotle, in his commentary on the Constitution for Athens, defends the use of public altars even though he's against superstition you know and they're like wait that's not that's not what anybody means by city but it is what augustine means because the city of god is defined by the love of god even to the contempt of self and nobody thinks of city that way either you mm -hmm. know but uh, and and this is why i would propose that you know oikos polis family city there really is a sense in which you know, the family has been truncated, reduced to a kind of domestic unit, when in fact what Christ has introduced through the church is a, a divine kinship that we need to recover. And again, not primarily in theoretical terms or just through political programs, but the sacraments that constitute the liturgy that gives us joy. We have all the raw materials to develop a political alternative without fleeing anywhere. You know, there's the Benedict option. I prefer the St. Jose Maria option, you know, and that is contemplatives in the middle of the world. I mean, there might become a time where they separate us because of what they call hate speech or whatever. But between now and then, we've got to learn to be leavened in whole new ways and just simply counteract their cynicism with a joy, the joy of the gospel. Patrick, could I sort of throw an objection, if you might, don't mind, which I'm sh I, I know has been thrown at uh, your position, but um, we, we're talking about the different uses of words. So I use the word liberty like this, and he uses it like that. C couldn't somebody say something like this, that, um, that actually when the, um, when the American Constitution was written, it did have the correct conception. And what happens in time is that it's kind of, as it were, it, it, it's been misunderstood. Because in a way, maybe your position is, is more like somehow America sort of swallowed a time-release suicide pill when it wrote the Constitution out of a kind of you know, Lockean understanding of liberty. And actually what's happening is this, this is just the outworking of, you know, they, everyone stayed actually strict to the project, and this is the fruits of the project. And so in a sense, somebody like um, uh, Justice Kennedy when he says, oh, in the American Constitution, I can find a right for gay marriage, he's right, it is in there. In a way, in a sense, you're kind of agreeing with him, but somebody else might say, no, 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 no. You know, we, sh we shouldn't be fleeing the founding ideas. We, we, you know, the problem in America is we've got to get back to the founding ideas. 
Uh, if somebody says, no, no, it, it's a matter of, you know, there's an agenda which has misinterpreted what actually was good, how, how do you kind of deal with that? Well, the, 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 just to speak specifically about the American founding, the American founding, like any political moment, was multivocal. Like you had many different voices. You had pretty radical voices like a Thomas Jefferson who was a deist and wanted to rewrite the Bible, among other things, to more or less get rid of anything that smacked of the miraculous or the supernatural. Then you had very pious people who understood, I think, and indeed drew on this older understanding of, liberal, uh, of liberty as a kind of form of self-governance and self-rule. So we can look to different authors and find evidence. But it's certainly there that this, uh, this more Lockean understanding of liberty is present at the time of the American founding. And at least what I want to say is that Strand had a very powerful constituency, uh, had a very, very powerful constituency that tended to, in the same way that we have today, an elite that tends to dominate our airwaves and, and sets the terms of the debate, that Strand had a very powerful presence to the point in which people began speaking of liberty in precisely those terms fairly early on. When Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s, uh, uh, giving rise to his great book, Democracy in America, he makes the following observation. He says, Americans always speak and justify their actions in terms of self-interest. He says, even when they're acting altruistically, they speak and justify those actions in terms of, of self-interest. And then he has this great line. He says, they do more honor to their philosophy than to themselves. And the argument in my book in some ways is that America, uh, to the extent it was a, a nation that was never fully liberal, was in many ways because we acted better than we spoke. We, our, our, our actions, mm -hmm. how we actually lived in the world was better than our philosophy. Our problem now in some ways is that we are conforming our actions to our philosophy. And this is why liberalism failed, because liberalism succeeded. Mm -hmm. We are more and more those radically individuated autonomous selves that was pictured and portrayed at the time uh, of the origins of, of liberal philosophy. And so, the, so the question, this is why I conclude the book by arguing maybe the first task at hand mm -hmm. is not necessarily to replace this philosophy with a different philosophy, although I think we have a philosophy and a theology that's better, mm -hmm. but to, re to repopulate the practices. Mm -hmm. right. And it lasted so long, in a certain sense you could say, why is the decay, how could, how could it last so long and the decay come at the end? What was it, is it sort of parasitical? It's yeah. a parasite on, on other things, yeah, on Christianity? Th right. Oh, I think it is deeply parasitical on Christianity, mm -hmm. and, and it kind of draws down this reservoir without ever being able to replenish it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as, as tends to happen, the more, the, the more that that is drawn down, the emptier it gets, the more that this kind of process accelerates. And so why we're seeing this you know, almost you know, day by day, the radicalization uh, that, we're, that yesterday seemed to be uh, out of bounds now suddenly seems to be that which must be acceptable. Mm -hmm. You know, your colleague at Notre Dame, Brad Gregory, has the unintended reformation. And, and it's not just parasitical against Christianity. It really is a sense in which it's parasitical against Catholic Christianity. Because when you go back to the Reformation, you know, what looms so large in Luther's vocabulary is liberty, freedom, Galatians. But what he's done with it is it's freedom from the Pope. It's freedom from the hierarchy. It's freedom from the sacraments and all of these other accoutrements that have complicated the simple relationship between Jesus and me or Jesus and you. You know, and so that negative thrust that is freedom from, you know, I would say from the 1500s on, you really have faith weaponized against tradition, you know, against works and all of this. But, you know, you have to trace this back and, you know, to the, the Enlightenment in the 1600s then says, well, it's not faith anymore, it's reason, it's not theology, it's, it's philosophy, it's not the church, it's the state. And, you know, this sort of thing might just seem like an academic exercise, but it's essential for us as Catholics, I find, to go back and discover who we are now based upon what we've been and how much we've allowed a secularized society to kind of confuse us so that we think that the founding fathers, if we just went back there and their intention, I mean, pragmatically, there is some real important and profound wisdom in doing that. But in, long, in, in, in thinking long term, we've got to go back before the founding fathers and go back to the church fathers mm -hmm. and see what God used them to found. And it's like, this could end up being a much greater gift we give to America than just Americanism. Yeah. And, and why people still buy into liberalism? Because I, I guess if you go out in the street, I mean, many people would say, yeah, I'm for liberalism. I mean, is it propaganda? They, 
they're frightened of the alternatives, the bogeyman of sort of communism on one side and, I don't know, being thrown to the sort of capitalist lions on the other side. Was, was something else I, going on? I, I think what's striking right now, at least in our politics, is how many people in some way or another are abandoning liberalism. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look today on the left, you see this embrace, a uh, full-throated embrace of socialism, mm -hmm. the idea that the state should increasingly take over more and more of society, the market, and so forth, but also remake the family and the image of the autonomous, liberated self, right? Sexuality is simply something we make, it's plastic. I mean, it's really just stunning uh, to see that occurring on the left. But also on the political right now, I think you have it in your own way a kind of pushback against the idea of the inevitability of globalization, mm -hmm. the idea that somehow boundaries and borders, a sense of nationhood or national identity is somehow irrelevant, that's, that's being uh, contested. In other words, the trajectory of liberalism is a kind of world in which we are all autonomously free, in which we can move wherever it is we wish to go, in which mm -hmm. there should be no boundary mm -hmm. or border or limit to how we can self-create. So it seems to me right now, the political spectrum in both the United States as well as Europe is actually uh, in many ways kind of engaging in a kind of de facto rejection of liberalism. And I think that's one of the reasons why my book has provoked such a conversation, not only in Catholic circles, mm -hmm. but well outside, including a, an endorsement by President Ob Obama, mm -hmm. all of whom are realizing, left, right, center, and otherwise, that something is deeply fundamentally changing in the world today. But all the people can see is still the alternative of communism and fascism. Is that the point? They, they, I mean, they may want to flee the liberalism, but That's where to? Right. Well, so you have, you know, in some sense, you have the political right now, right now saying, what, you just want to make us into Venezuela or the Soviet Union. And you have the political left saying, that you just want to make us into Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So this is, in some ways, unfortunately, we still occupy this world in which these seem to be the alternatives, liberty, equality, fraternity. And I think, again, as Catholics, what we can really offer is say, look, there's an alternative that take, partakes of none of these, none of the above. Mm -hmm. We have really something genuine, distinctive, and true to offer. Uh, and it's really simply a, uh, the capacity of us to articulate that and to make that case. That's fantastic. Well, when we come back, our panel and our guest uh, will have their final thoughts on today's topic. So stay with us. What was once admired as democracy is now redescribed as populism, nationalism, or of course, fascism. The enforcement of speech and thought codes in the schools, on college campuses, at workplaces, and in the public square seek to function in the role of the censors of old, maintaining an order that increasingly relies on sheer force and threat of bankruptcy or imprisonment to achieve obedience. Dr. Patrick Deneen. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. William, uh, could you start us off with your thoughts on today's topic? Yeah, I, I think uh, what I'm feeling is that, of course, that the problem we're facing in society, it is in part philosophical, bad philosophy. It is in part anthropo anthropology, bad anthropology. But I think there's an additional element, and it's called original sin. The issue is that even if we had the best philosophy and the best anthropology, we still have the problem of original sin. And unless and, and that's factored in, unless that's somehow dealt with, then I, I can't really see a kind of way out uh, of the problem we're in. It's interesting in my reading, at least, of the Catholic social teaching, particularly if you read Rerum Nirvana and Quadragesimo Anno, they both make this point rather, uh, rather in a developed sense. They say, okay, we can make this structural change and this structural change and you should behave like this and you should behave like this. But then, he, then Leo says, but look, the, bo the bottom line is even the plans and devices of the wisest men will be of no avail unless there is a return to Christian virtue. That's how he says it. Because society is made up of people, and it's as good as what's going on inside people. And I think this is what, Scott, you were sort of touching on this several times in our conversation, that there's got to be an inner renewal if we're going to break out of this kind of box of liberalism or maybe communism or maybe fascism. It's got to be an inner renewal. And the fact is the inner renewal is not in our hands. It can only happen by divine activity on us. And that's why the Christian faith, that's why the church has the ultimate solution to social problems. It doesn't have the sort of minutiae of ideas, but it has the power to change people, has access to the power to change people. If people are changed, society is changed. You know, you, you can, they say, you know, you can, take old, you can take the girl out of New York, but you can't take New York out of the girl. The communists proved that. You can change the system, 
but it doesn't change the interior. Mm. And until the church, until Christianity has a bigger place in society, I, I, don't, I don't see how we can go beyond analysis in a certain sense. Right. Wow. I was mentioning during the break that there is something inside of me that is irrepressible because the truth of the faith is not just, you know, meant to be lived out privately in the liturgy or in personal devotions, but it really does cry out for a, a social embodiment, a public expression. And Christian civilizations in the past have sort of proven that this is not something that is, you know, hogwash. Uh, I remember a doctoral seminar back in the 80s, uh, the heady days when John Paul was still young and the moral majority was there. and you had a kind of coalition of evangelical Protestants and Catholics in the pro-life cause. And I was taking a doctoral seminar. We were reading Newhouse before he'd become a Catholic, the naked public square. And we were finding in the process that individualism, capitalism, socialism, collectivism really are fraternal. They're, they're tied to liberalism. And I read for the first time what you just mentioned, rerum novarum, quadragesimano, the Catholic social teaching going back to Leo XIII. It's not individualism, it's not collectivism. It's a form of familism, although he doesn't use the term. But once you see that family is an extended social network, it's really what he's getting at. Private property is not just for individuals. The universal destination of property is for all of us to be a family. And I just remember thinking as a Protestant that the Catholic Church is not what von Mises said, it's not pseudo-socialism. It really is the alternative. And I, and I just think that there's a new generation of Catholics arising right now, and I hope they're watching EWTN, because it's, it's not enough to diagnose the illness, especially when you're sitting on the cure, to live family life. You know, Father Keith made this point that if Catholics simply live the grace of the sacrament of matrimony for one generation, the result would be a Christian civilization regardless of the politicians we elected. And I really believe that's the challenge. John Dewey, our, you know, our democratic nemesis was right. The family is the most anti-democratic institution. You don't vote for your parents, you don't even elect your siblings, you know. And yet you live this kind of life in a way that is so subtle and yet so transformative if we let the grace and the mercy of Christ do it. And so at the end of the day, there's a lot of theoretical work to be done, a lot. On the other hand, you know, you can go home and live this out and change the world, diaper by diaper. Um, one of the things, one of the responses to my book that um, challenges uh, whether or not we should even think of something beyond liberalism is the fear that the only thing that awaits us after liberalism is a society of arbitrary authoritarianism, a kind of return of the Middle Ages and its oppression of the peasants, uh, a kind of vision of limited uh, economic uh, and uh, uh, sort of personal vocational possibilities. Um, in particular, what looms large often is fear that we'll, we'll simply see the reconstitution of an old aristocratic order who simply governs arbitrarily over uh, over the over the citizens over those who are not in command in the last chapter uh, of the book or the second to last chapter of the book I, I talk however about the somewhat again ironic and yet in some ways predictable rise of what I call the new aristocracy the, or the, what we think about today as the meritocracy and since I've taught in institutions like Princeton and Georgetown and Notre Dame have been very much involved in the formation of this new meritocracy. <laughs> uh, and, and the striking thing about this new aristocracy that has arisen not only in spite of liberalism, but in many ways because of it, precisely uh, because of the uh, dynamics that are described by my student, if you're not winning, you're falling behind, is that this is the most peculiar aristocracy maybe in the history of the world. It's a leadership class that denies it's a leadership class. It's a, a collection of elites that denies that they are actually elite. In fact, you spend any time at one of these elite universities and you'll hear constantly the refrain, it's only us egalitarians here, <laughs> which I think expresses a big reason for why we see all of the social justice causes that allows the kind of prevailing belief that we're, we're all good egalitarians. Again, if we, if we ask the question, what kind of a society gives debt as, an, as its inheritance to its children, what kind of society has in some ways a leadership class, which every society has, that denies that it is in some ways a leadership class, that seeks to cloak that, uh, and that in fact seems to offer so little uh, to those who are not members of the leadership class. And here again, I think about this as a kind of part of what it is to be a Catholic vocation. 
which is to see our work not as simply something that I own. My body isn't something that I own. My work isn't something that I own. The products of my work aren't something that, that I own. Property isn't this, just mere, this thing that I hold tightly to myself. These are gifts. These are gifts that we're given. This kind of talents that we have are gifts that we are given and we are uh, uh, given the privilege to, to cultivate them. And one of the things, especially as someone who teaches at one of these universities, that I think it's incumbent upon us is to cultivate the sense that we live in a world replete and full of gifts uh, and to develop that sense of gratitude for that gifts. And I think in such a way, and I think this is deeply Catholic, but it's a way you can speak to people beyond the Catholic faith uh, to, to cultivate again a sense of gratitude and a sense of responsibility and obligation to the future, uh, to future generations, to the future of this planet. Uh, and to uh, the future of our civilization. So I think that there's a task that touches on every aspect of life, but at least in my little corner of the world and thinking about those who, who have jobs, who have work, uh, the, in which you participate, participate in these parts of the world, the call, and among other things, to, to cultivate that sense of being gifted, of being given a gift, is something central to what I think the task that lies before us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We really greatly appreciate this conversation. Um, his book is Why Liberalism Failed. And if you want to learn more about uh, today's topic, you can grab this book. But we also have this free handout for you. Uh, it's yours by simply going to online to faithandreason.com. Uh, this is an article that Dr. Deneen has written. Or by calling the number you'll see on the screen in just a moment. You know, my, my final thought on today's topic as we, were, um, as we were talking about this culture in which we live is I, I couldn't help but remind, you know, be reminded of the Exodus, of you know, the Hebrew people. God wanted, uh, God wanted them to be His people and called them out. And one of, the, uh, one of the great gifts of this was the gift of the Sabbath, a day off from work, a day where we do not identify ourselves. Um, by what we do, and uh, we take a break from that and devote ourselves to God. You know, I think it's not just diaper to diaper, but it's Sunday to Sunday. Yeah. I think that if we as a society uh, can live that resistance, that live that freedom, this is what God has wanted to do from the beginning. We see this in the story of Scripture, that there are political systems that are always looking to deny our true identity as people of God. And by being faithful to the Lord, we can stand up and claim that we are more than just uh, this legal system, this political system, this ideology, but we truly are sons and daughters of God. That's certainly something we hope we impart on our students here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and we'd love you to be a part of that mission. We're grateful that you watch this show, and we pray many blessings for you and our family and our country uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ can show us what freedom truly means. Amen. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381 or call 740-283-6357.